welcome to another live stream so the first thing you'll notice is that we're a bit uh low tech today so basically the whatever you want to call them tech gremlins uh you know like they've been mugging me off today and um hey everyone just let me know if there's any um any audio issues or anything and i'll try and sort them out but i think i've got everything right but basically um yeah tech gremlins been mugging me off today and that, that to be honest they're starting to piss me off um so uh i the usual camera is not is not connecting for some reason and i've i've sent a message to the people to see if they can figure it out because i look i scoured the internet to try and find what you know was i think i know what the issue is but i don't know how to solve it is is the thing um so i've sent them a message but i'll i'll see how it goes so today we're very high tech and just using my web <laughs> my like built-in webcam for my uh for my laptop but the microphone's still here so the audio audio should be good um hey everyone in the chat i hope you're all doing well um but so today um, I'm going to go through a few things to start with, but because this is a stream about the road to antinatalism, the series, I am going to try and keep any other stuff to a minimal and just focus on that because we can have chill streams for like general banter and stuff. But um, first thing I want to say is uh, if you haven't already... Um, and you have Twitter, uh, follow me on Twitter because I do daily updates on there. Like any any sort of, the YouTube community tab, I put specific stuff on there, but um, I put everything on, on Twitter. Well, not everything. It's not like I, I don't like upload my, fucking tweet my shoe size, but um, you get what I mean. Like I'm much more regular on, on Twitter multiple times a day, um, all that sort of stuff. Um, and I put updates on there that I don't put on YouTube. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's Twitter. And uh, the reason, one of the reasons, it's related to what I'm saying now, um, is uh, I was actually at a conference recently, and I'm going to speak more. I'm not sure. I haven't decided if I'm going to talk about this like before we start or after we finish doing the, the actual series that we're going to be watching. But um, basically, I I don't think I've spoken about that on on YouTube yet, and I've I've I did announce it on Twitter. So that is a sort of you know about that conference. That's a sort of like um, sneak peek you'd get on Twitter that you wouldn't get here. Um, other thing is, I will be keeping my eye on the chat. But if anyone has like a specific question or a comment that they definitely want to get seen, um, I've put in the pinned comment at the top of the chat. And there's a Streamlabs link there. Streamlabs link there. Um, so uh, if you send over like a small uh, tip, you'll be able to leave a message with it and all of that sort of stuff. And um, yeah, I'll definitely see it then. But I, I will try to keep my eye on, on the chat. Um, so today uh, we're going to be watching the Road to Antinatalism, which basically is I, I've never seen it before, first up. So this is going to be my first time seeing it. So I can't give like too detailed a description because I don't actually know, like I haven't, I haven't seen it. Um, but basically, so there's a YouTuber, uh, antinatalist YouTuber called Glynos, who uh, he hasn't really made any content for a while, as far as I'm aware, at least not on his Glynos channel. Um, but he was quite active back in the day. Uh, he... he uh, I, th I think we mentioned him in my um, my recent conversation with Amanda, which I put up, which was a couple videos ago. Um, and basically, Glynos, he used to be much more active, um, and he hasn't been in the past couple of years, I think. But I may stand corrected on that. Um, but one of the thing, one of the sort of big things that he did do, he did a few big things. But one of the things he did was put this series together, The Road to Antinatalism. And as far as I'm aware, basically what I know about it is that all in all, I think the it's I think it's a few episodes. I think it's like um, 
eight or nine episodes or something like that. And all in all, I think they total around an hour. I think I calculated it to be something like that. And it's basically supposed to be an introduction to antinatalism. It's supposed to be sort of like the main arguments, um, the rebuttals to the main sort of counter arguments, and maybe a few other things as well. Um, and one of the reasons I wanted to, there were a couple of reasons I wanted to watch this actually. So the first one is, um, I just haven't seen it before, and it's like an antinatalist series, so I, you know. Um, uh, the, uh, but the second reason was I'm also planning at some point, I think people have seen in like a couple of my streams and videos that I've mentioned that I think like uh, veganism has like these cultural assets, right? Like Gary Yotsky's speech, Earthling, stuff like that. Um, Earthling Ed's like 30 days, 30 excuses. And antinatalism has some of that, but it doesn't have a l as much. And I think it's something that we need to like build, you know, as like a community. Um, and I want to help do that. And one of the things I actually wanted to do was um, put together like a, on YouTube, a sort of quite like well done, concise, basically has most of the stuff you need, um, introduction series to antinatalism. Um, and so I wanted to see what Glynis had, had put together because, um, you know, I, wa I wanted to see like how he structured it, all this sort of stuff for a bit of research. Um, and so that in the one that I create, um, I can hopefully make it more detailed, more extensive, all of this sort of stuff, like build on his sort of shoulders, if you get what I mean. Um, I just saw Sid in the chat. No, I'm not Glynos. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I don't have his voice. <laughs> um, but maybe you don't know what his voice sounds like, but you'll hear what it's like in, in, in the video soon. Um, but yeah, that's, so that's the second reason I wanted to watch it. But, um, yeah, so was there anything else I wanted to go over before, um, before we started? I'm not sure. Um, I'll have a quick whiz through the chat, um, and try and catch anything. Um, but, uh, yeah, so basically, um, I got two other things that I was going to, um, announce, but I will put those at the end, um, after we've finished reacting to the or watching the the video um the only other thing i will say now is uh the channel is approaching 1000 subs and as some of you may have seen i put a, a form link out you know on the internet ether um for people to put in their questions because i was going to do like a thousand subscribers asking me anything um I, i've already so i've already filmed it i got a bunch of a bunch of questions came in. Um, so I filmed it uh, today. Um, so if you haven't submitted questions already, um, like, sorry, you're too late. Um, I haven't hit 1,000 subscribers yet, but I had to film it beforehand and then I'll release it when it hits 1,000 subscribers. Um, so that's all done. Um, I think, I can't remember how many questions it was. I think it was around 30, something like that. Um, maybe a bit more. Um, but yeah, I'll quick, quickly whiz through the chat, um, and just say hello to everyone and then we can get cracking on the, uh, on the video or on the, on the series. Um, so, hey, um, hey, Yannis, uh, discovered my channel back in, uh, December. Uh, well, welcome to the, welcome to the channel. I don't know if this is your first stream, but, um, I welcome. Um, and you had something important you wanted to ask me, um. Yeah, sure. I, I mean, if it's something you you want to put in the chat, then you're welcome. Uh, if if you want to um, send it to me directly, uh, my links are in the description of this live stream. You can find me on Twitter um, or, or email me. My email is there as well. Um, hey, Masilia and uh, and Jay. Um, I can't I can't remember. Uh, yeah. Okay. Sure. Um, yeah, yeah. So I, I've seen, I'm seeing a couple of names in the chat already, like No Injustice Last Forever um, and Jay. Uh, your your questions were all answered. Um, uh, and then, uh, hey, Vigangelism. Uh, I can't, I don't actually know my shoe size, to be honest. Um, it was so like, I, I have like, um, like one of the things I hate most in the world 
is uh clothes shopping like i fucking despise it it stresses me out um so i like very re- to be honest the most recent thing i bought uh was was some shoes um but i just blocked it out of my memory because I, I hate doing that um da, 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 da. and okay hey and amanda's here um cool i think that's i think that's everyone has been said hello to sad vegan um said um i'm not sure how to say your name sorry but it looks polish i think um cool all right let's um without further ado let's hopefully you can see that um and i i've uh, tried jiggling all the audio around and stuff so hopefully um hopefully the audio will be will be fine um uh cool okay cool so so this first um this first one is called uh the road to antinatalism introduction it's only like a just under two minutes so i'm i think you know this is going to be like uh what have you what did like what have you got to look forward to in this series but let's give it a whiz fucking hell that was anticlimactic <laughs> the play button didn't start didn't work <laughs> why is okay um okay cool um i think it's working now yeah the stream's still going um that's so weird youtube isn't uh youtube isn't playing let me just reload the um reload the thing that's so fucking weird hang on a minute let me go back on this um what the fuck is going on that's so weird um okay cool let me let me get it up in another um in another tab okay cool da, da, da. this is so weird so i've got the stream up on my phone and it's still going but everything is like weirding out on my end why does stuff like this always happen i don't understand this is why you shouldn't create people because then they have to deal with shit like this okay cool okay cool so that that seems to be working now all right okay so can you can you guys hear this please tell me you can hear that just whack whack in the chat um that you can hear that do you hear that music yeah yeah okay cheers for that sid um i don't know what's going on on my end it's being fucking weird um but i'm you know if it's working for you guys i'm just going to ignore all of the signs um cool let's go Antinatalism is a philosophy that attributes a negative value to birth and states that it is always wrong to have children. Proponents of the antinatalist philosophy include Abul Allah al Ma'ari, Arthur Schopenhauer, and more recently. I think his voice is kind of quiet, right? I think you guys might need to turn your volume up. I mean, you can, I, mean I, I know you'll be able to figure that out yourselves, I guess. David Benatar. It's been labeled the greatest taboo, and antinatalists are often wrongly dubbed as being angsty nihilists sad sacks, and suicidal depressives. In this series, I'm going to explore the road to antinatalism. What do you need to accept to become an antinatalist? How do antinatalists reach their conclusions? I'm also going to look at the reasons why some people don't accept these conclusions, and I'll attempt to prove why counter-arguments to antinatalism don't hold up under logical scrutiny. I'll break the road to antinatalism down into seven basic steps, and a separate video will address each one of these steps. Seven steps are the materialistic universe, evolution and motivation, recognizing value, nature versus logic, being born versus not being born, the step to ethelism, and a graceful exit. This series deals with the philosophical arguments for antinatalism, 
Antinatalism compares coming into existence with not coming into existence and reaches the conclusion that not coming into existence is the preferable state. Antilatalism is not a suicide cult, and comments such as why don't you kill yourself, although inevitable, are neither productive nor are they welcomed. Cool. I'm, I'm that, so that's that's the introduction. That's the first um, bit. I'm hoping uh, I'm hoping you could all like hear that. Um, so yeah, he he was talking about like antinatalists getting labelled as like depressive um, sort of. Uh, people i was actually talking to someone about this t talking about this yeah i don't know what the english is for that but um i was talking to someone about this today uh about um like antinatalism and depression and like some people if if you like I, so i'm very fortunate i i've never really gone through i i mean i've been through down periods when bad things have happened in my life but i've never been through a period where i would label it as depression right um so i've been very fortunate in that way um but i i've come across people who whether in person or online who as soon as an antinatalist says that they have at some point been depressed or are depressed now um they instantly get dismissed along with antinatalism because it's like, oh, well, you're just depressed, so I don't have to listen to you anymore. And it means that antinatalism invali is invalid. And I think the the mechanism that is going around in their head is they're thinking, okay, well, they're depressed, so they're not in like a, 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 a reasonable level-headed state of mind. And so any conclusions they draw about life cannot be clear-sighted or valid, basically, is how I think that they see it and i think that is um bullshit basically um so how i was talking to this person today i was saying like the fact that people whether they're antinatalist or not get depressed i don't think clouds their judgment on whether we should create life or not if and it, and it doesn't always do this, but someone could argue that it actually makes their thinking more clear because I think when you're talking about creating someone, I think it's much more dangerous for someone to be thinking about that topic when they are clouded by optimism and they overreach and then create someone because of their optimism, like delusional optimism. And I think that's far more dangerous than someone uh having their uh judgment on the on this topic um clouded as it is um as it's put forward as it's said um by depression A and w which would mean that they are on the side of not creating someone and the reason i think that is that is that is better than than delusional optimism is because um no one gets hurt in that situation like if you don't create someone and you're wrong who's lost out um whereas if you create someone and and you're wrong uh then then someone has lost out you've, you've just given someone a death sentence basically and you don't know how their life is going to go it could be fucking awful um so yeah i actually think the experience of depression can actually can bring clarity to your judgment on on whether um on on this topic right um and i think the recognition that people do get depressed i think is just another argument for antinatalism i mean why would you put someone in that situation i don't understand that like ha i don't understand how you can see someone with depression and be like ha 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 that's an argument against antinatalism what <laughs> in what <laughs> what um so yeah, I don't get these people who who um, dismiss people because they're like depressed. Um, it just seems very sh short sighted to me. All right, so this is episode one, and it's called the materialistic universe. Materialism, or physicalism, is the idea that everything in existence is made up of physical matter and energy. 
the universe, its galaxies, stars, solar systems, planets, and everything which exists on these planets can be explained using the language of physics. Even human emotions, such as joy, despair, and fear, can be reduced to a physical explanation of bits of matter interacting with each other and electrical activity in the brain. The idea of materialism has been around for almost 3,000 years and can be traced back to ancient India, ancient China, and ancient Greece. However, the development of the Age of Enlightenment and the recent success of physical sciences such as physics, chemistry and astronomy has catapulted materialism to being the only logically sound description of reality. The evidence for materialism is overwhelming. The consistency, accuracy and predictability of science renders it both truthful and useful. Materialism thrives in the scientific community. A scientific experiment which includes non-physical components is not scientific. Science provides us with the purest and most reliable method of discovery, and deals only with the material world. In science, if it's not physical, it doesn't exist. Almost all people accept that there is a physical world. However, the majority of people think that there's more to this universe, and more to a human than simply physical matter. It's interesting. Um, so, like, I... Judging by what Glenos has just said here, I guess I would be considered... Um, a materialist uh now i i don't know if i would go as far as say the only thing that exists in the universe is the material but i would say the only thing we have good reason to think that exists is the material um you know like m maybe maybe there is immaterial stuff out there um but i'm just not sure we have good reason to think that yet um but it's interesting because I I have I have quite a few friends who uh, are ver also very sort of like um, they're generally atheist, quite materialistic, etc. Um, but actually, through use of psychedelics, they have sort of softened their view of that, and they do actually think that there is an immaterial side to the universe, um, which and the sort of um, it's be consciousness basically carries the water for that um, claim um, for them. And it's interesting. I mean, I haven't had um, a psychedelic experience, let alone one that would uh, lead me to sort of believe something like that. Um, but it's interesting because these are people th whose judgment I do trust. And they also recognize that, you know, psychedelics are a drug that changes your brain state. And so they, you know any you can't a hundred percent trust anything that you would learn on them as being um perfectly mapped onto reality um but even though they recognize that they do still hold that position of a more softened materialism which is interesting um and I don't know what to think about it at the moment. I think I would need to have a psychedelic experience like that to be able to understand where they're coming from. And maybe I would get to the same conclusion. I'm not sure. But it's it's interesting. Um, so I'm open-minded, but at the moment I would say I'm um, materialist. Um, and just before we continue, uh, so I'm not going to read out their name in just in case they you know don't want me to. But... Um, uh, someone has just tim tipped three pounds, which amazing. Like, thank you um, for that. Um, that's very kind. Um, just saying, great channel and approach. Um, thank, thank you so much. Uh, I'm, like, I'm glad that uh, you know people are sort of appreciate um, the work that's put into this, um, and like, and get value from it. And I'm, you know, I've got like a lot more planned. It's just a matter of time of you know finding the time of when to do it. But um, yeah, thank thank you so much for that. Um, it's really appreciated. Um, yeah, let's let's continue with the uh, materialism. The idea that there is both a physical and non-physical is often labelled as dualism. Most people consider themselves to be mind-body dualists, meaning that they believe in the existence of their physical body, but also believe that there is some non-physical entity, typically a mind or a soul, controlling the body, a type of ghost in the machine belief. Mind-body dualists face enormous challenges when defending their position. 
Firstly, it's impossible to describe the characteristics of something that doesn't exist in time and space. Secondly, they would have to prove how this entity, which doesn't exist in time and space, could interact with a physical body to perform its various functions. They would also need to account for reasons why a person with brain damage undergoes vast changes in their personality and decision-making, if their personality and decision-making is held in the non-physical entity. Regardless of these problems, mind-body dualism is arguably the most intuitive explanation for what we are. However, advances in psychology, and particularly in neuroscience, have discredited mind-body dualism in academic and scientific circles, and it's expected to have a trickle-down effect on the masses. Many believe that intuition is far greater than education, and that humans will never fully embrace the idea of our mind being purely physical, that is a byproduct of our brain. The round earth theory is a classic example of scientific evidence and education overcoming intuition. Another argument against materialism is solipsism. Solipsism claims that the only certainty is in the existence of one's own mind. Anything else, including the external world or other minds, can never be known. The French philosopher René Descartes famously stated, I think therefore I am. This has become the motto of the solipsist. Solipsism asserts, I know that I exist because I have consciousness. My senses prove that I am real. My senses are not always reliable. For example, when I dream, my senses are activated and I believe the contents of my dream to be real, but I awake and discover that they are not. If my senses are unreliable, I cannot use them to verify the existence of the external world. Nor can I use them to prove the existence of other minds, as I have access only to my own mind. It's been claimed that solipsism can never be confirmed nor refuted, that it is a type of a philosophical stalemate. Despite this, solipsism can be shown to be problematic in a number of ways. If solipsism is true, it means that I have created everything, every piece of music, literature, film, every religion, war and genocide. Is it really plausible that my mind has invented all of this? Is it not a delusion of the greatest grandeur to hold to this belief? Wouldn't a mind capable of creating this world be able, with little effort, to break the consistencies it has set up for itself? If my mind created this world, then surely my mind can reverse the effects of ageing, break the laws of gravity, escape death, and so on. Reality would certainly show itself to you should you decide to jump out of the window of your top floor apartment. Yeah, it's interesting, this solipsism. Um, I haven't, like, done too much sort of, like, studying around it or anything. But um, the, uh, the like, the... I'm not sure if you would class this as, as solipsism, but it, it seems to have, like, very similar... It seems to stand, like, shoulder to shoulder with it, which is when I've done, like, animal rights outreach, I have... Not very commonly, but occasionally come into contact with people who will say, well, the only person I can prove exists is me and everyone around me, humans or animals, will, you know, uh, it could just be a figment of my imagination and I've got no way of proving that they are actually moral and morally relevant individuals and so I'm not going to treat them as such. And when I ask these people about this, you know how that works because it seems like top class bullshit to me um they say well the only reason they treat humans with dignity is because one they have an emotional sort of uh reaction to seeing humans in pain but also um they would you know there are laws in place and stuff so they um they would get like put in jail or whatever um but the the laws and for these people the emotional connection apparently um is not relevant with animals you know like animals have some laws protecting them um but not in, to any meaningful degree um yeah and it's uh i mean it ju i mean like talk about putting yourself at the center of the universe <laughs> Um, I mean, e even if I had that mindset, right, even if I had this mindset of like, okay, I'm the only one that I can prove exists and I don't know if these others exist, give them the benefit of the doubt. I mean, come on. I mean, imagine if it was the other way around and it was someone else 
you, you know, some like um, someone else was saying this same thing and they were using it to inflict pain on you. Would you not want them to give you the benefit of the doubt? I mean, it just seems like such self-centered BS, um, this line of like ethical reasoning. Um, I don't know if any of you guys have come across people like that, but they generally tend to be just like scumbags from my experience. ...and test your newfound abilities. Applying solipsism to everyday life also highlights its problems. If I one day go home and find a friend or relative in severe pain, bleeding to death, begging me to get help, and I state that I cannot objectively verify his existence, let alone the existence of his suffering and blood, the telephone which is required to call for help, the existence of the emergency services operator and so on, this will surely lead to some pretty negative consequences. Should this friend subsequently die due to my negligence, my brain would then surely invent some police officers, a court, and a jail for myself to reside in, along with some overly friendly inmates, coupled with a feeling of discomfort in a particular area. <laughs> in conclusion, we can assert with absolute certainty at least the fact that something exists. We can logically reach the conclusion that we are part of a consistent external physical universe and have an ethical obligation to recognize the consequences and potential consequences of our actions. Arguments against the physical world are tantamount to linguistic games, mental masturbation or mental impairment. Anything supernatural cannot be proven scientifically or logically. Arguments for the supernatural, be it mind, souls, gods, or supercosmic Wu energy vibrationism, rely on unverifiable anecdotal evidence. <laughs> I, I, I know people who are on the vibration wave. <laughs> it's funny. I mean, like, re really nice people, but, um, yeah, I just, I don't, I don't know about some of their beliefs. Wishful thinking and faith. Although it's not impossible for one who believes in supernatural phenomena to be an antinatalist, for many, accepting the fact that we live in a reality made up only of matter and energy is the first step to antinatalism. In the next video, I'll look at the implications to accepting this reality, and how those implications push us further down the road of antinatalism. Boom. Okay, so... The next one is evolution and motivation. Um, what, did, what did you guys think of that, uh, that first... I mean the second but the first proper episode um it was interesting i th i mean i think um i was saying at the start that i was going to use this as sort of research to see what i could and couldn't include in my introduction to antinatalism series but um i think uh actually now having seen the first one it seems like uh glinos is actually coming at it from a slightly different angle which actually to be honest is in the title so i should have got this already he's talking about the road to antinatalism so it's the things leading up to antinatalism as the end point whereas mine is going to be an introduction to so it's not about what leads up to antinatalism it's just about okay we're at antinatalism and here's an introduction to the sort of arguments and stuff like that so slightly different i'm not sure then how much research i'm going to be able to glean from this but like it's going to be interesting nonetheless anyway it's just different from what I was going to put together, which I guess is good because, you know, you don't want two of the same thing on the Internet. Um, let's just see if anyone has any thoughts in the chat. Um, OK, nothing. Yeah, nothing, nothing massive. No paragraphs or anything. When you reach the conclusion that there's only a materialistic universe, you rid yourself of several psychologically attractive and powerful concepts. We lose ideas that can, according to some, comfort us in times of hardship. Ideas such as everything happens for a reason and it's all part of God's plan. Yeah, I mean, if you're not indoctrinated from birth with uh, about religion, um, it just seems so obvious from the outside that it's just cope. Like, it just seems so obvious to me. Like, we evolved, we're here in a universe that there's no cosmic meaning for our lives. It does not care about what happens to us. The only reason we're here is that our DNA wants to replicate. And that's not the nicest, you know, that's not a comforting, like, reality. But reality doesn't exist to be comforting. 
and it's just so obvious that people over time i don't think it was just one person one day went ah we need to invent religion but they just evolved over time as a result of certain like inclinations we have of wanting to have comforting beliefs that we can hold over ourselves like a blanket you know on like a cold night or whatever hold like sheltering us from the um from the elements it just i don't know i just don't see how religious people can't see that but i guess when you're when you're in it it's hard to see right um Accepting the materialistic nature of our universe leaves us alone on a planet in an otherwise insignificant galaxy, with no higher power guiding us, no grand plan, no bigger picture. The idea is difficult for many to take, which perhaps explains people's reluctance to acknowledge the truth of our situation, but denial does not a truthful argument make. Does anyone know who this guy is? I've seen his face before. I'm sure Amanda will know if, if Amanda's still in the chat, but... I've seen this guy's face before, and he's been in a couple of the videos already um, of this series, and we're only three in, so he's got to be some sort of, like, key character of, like, what, like not ca not character as in he's invented him, obviously he's a real person, but I mean, like, a key person. Okay, but who, Anikantavad, Anikantavad, who is that, though? Um, I'll, I'll keep playing the video, but, um, yeah, if someone could let me know who that, I who he is, like... In a dualistic world, the big questions are easy to answer. Why is there something instead of nothing? God done it. How was life created? God done it. Why do humans have such great levels of awareness? God done it. How do humans recognize rights and wrongs? God done it. Finding out the real. That's so English. <laughs> answer requires us to look at. Um, so Amanda's saying there was a point in time uh, that when you Googled David Benatai, his face was the one that would show up. Yeah, like Peter Singer's face come comes up as well. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's funny. Um, it's a actually talking of Peter Singer. I don't. I'm not sure if anyone saw. He's done a uh, interview recently, like very high quality interview in terms of like the aesthetics of it. Very nice looking, good audio, all of that sort of stuff. Um, with Rick Roll, who's like a vegan athlete, and it it was interesting. I mean, I didn't. To be honest, I didn't learn that much from it because I know like quite a lot of the things Peter Singer talks about anyway, so there wasn't really new content. But um, they did talk about how he's... And I... There was a clip... There was a bit in it where he very tangentially talks about antinatalism. So I did a video on that, um, which I think is the most recent video I've done. But um, he, he also talked about how um, he has... Uh, no, he didn't. He didn't get. Uh, well, okay, yeah. People have been saying Rick Roll like the joke, um, but um, yeah, he's also releasing a something anniversary um, edition of Animal Liberation, and I don't. I haven't. I haven't actually got a copy of Animal Liberation, and I was trying to find an original copy because I really like the front cover of it, but it was like seven hundred pounds, <laughs> and I was like, no. So that he's releasing a new version um, that's updated, which is going to be cool. And I th apparently he's going to be talking about stuff like lab-grown meat and apparently wild animal suffering as well. Um, so that's going to be really interesting. Um, but yeah, that that's coming out in the middle of this year, so I'm looking forward to that, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to order that. Um, yeah. A little more closely. In this video, I'll look at what a human is from the materialistic point of view. How did human life get here? What do humans share with other life forms? And what makes us different from other life forms? I'll also touch on key points of the antinatalist argument, such as humans' tendency to project value and the nature of our addicted psychologies. So what is a human? Human life, like all life, can be traced back some 3.7 billion years. Like all life, it has a naturalistic origin. There are various approaches to abiogenesis, or the origin of life, but there's not yet a scientific consensus on the subject. Two things are certain, though. Firstly, life originated through a naturalistic process, and secondly, once life started, the process of evolution began. One thing that unites all living things is DNA. Without getting too technical, DNA is a molecule that contains genetic information that allows all living things to function, grow, and reproduce. In reproduction, the DNA molecule makes copies of itself to make a new living thing. 
These copies are not always perfect though, and as a result the next living thing will be slightly different from the previous one, allowing organisms with enough time to evolve into different species. Another thing that unites all living things is its need and ability to consume energy. Energy sources include some non-organic compounds, light, and most regrettably, consuming other living Oh, Amanda just put in the chat um, that David Benatar got fired from University of Cape Town. Um, no, I haven't read his uh, latest article. I didn't even see that he... What, um, two questions. Amanda, where is the best place to hear about updates of like what this you know how did you hear about that like where's the best place to hear updates and second of all um do you have a link to that um that uh article um if you do could you message it to me and i can uh i can link it in in the description of this live stream once it's finished and so people can find it um but uh yeah i um yeah okay no, I was going to say something, but I won't say it yet. Um, but, uh, yeah, okay, cool. Um. Things. So now we have a system where there are different kinds of living things. In order for those things to survive and... No, you won't be able to put a link in, in the chat, but if, if you can message me, like, on, on Facebook or something, and then I'll, I'll make it available to people, if that's all right. Make copies of themselves. Some of them need to eat the other things. Those things without a motivation to survive are likely to be eaten pretty quickly, leaving behind only organisms with a motivation to survive. Now we have only highly motivated organisms left. After four billion years of fitness tests, we are left with only living things which have the most efficient tools for their survival, be it tools for killing, tools for evading, or tools for quick and efficient reproduction. So how did humans get here? Without the teeth and claws of a lion, a stick insect's ability to hide itself, or the reproductive rate of a cockroach, human ancestors needed some other tool for survival. Our ticket to the present lies in our intelligence. Greater intelligence allowed our ancestors to make tools, create sophisticated hunting strategies, and predict and hypothesize. As with any other tool of evolution, due to the environmental pressures, that is, things wanting to consume our ancestors, the cleverest of the cleverest survived to pass on their DNA, as did the cleverest of the cleverest of the cleverest, and so on and so forth. Our evolved scheming tool allowed us to use language to pass on information and knowledge that would ordinarily take a much longer time to learn. With language, we were able to transfer knowledge and ideas at a much faster rate, and the invention of the printed word paved the way for yet more progress. Now we could store and archive information, People could specialise in different areas of knowledge and simply add to the current knowledge base, instead of having to spend an age relearning everything that had come before them. By standing on the shoulders of giants, we could see further than anyone had ever seen before. Unfortunately, knowledge wasn't the only thing that was spreading. Our first and worst attempts at reasoning, including religion, superstitions and other ideas about supernatural phenomena, were also being circulated. I don't know if any of you know who that guy is, but that's Carl Pilkington. He's a fucking legend. But what it's one of the most British people you'll ever meet. What possible survival value could belief in the untrue bring? Whilst it remains a contentious issue, it's believed that in the absence of truth, an untrue idea can carry with it some psychological benefits. Many see religion or belief in the afterlife as a natural defence mechanism against the psychologically crippling realisation that we, and all of those whom we love, will inevitably die. Others believe that religion propagated so successfully because those who took power realised its effectiveness in being able to control large amounts of people. It didn't stop at religion, though. The psychological disposition to placing value where none should be placed can be seen throughout the world. There is obviously some comforting and addicting aspect to projecting value on that which has no intrinsic value itself. Despite the comfort it may bring you, your God does not exist, your parents are not smiling down at you from a heaven, and your favourite football team winning has no value. Your beliefs in ghosts, karma, spiritual energy are pets, an internalisation of value tantamount to masturbation, a welcome distraction to those who cannot break from their psychological Savagery. <laughs> addictions. If we were to separate our rationally inquiring brain from our addictive emotional psychology, what would we see? The cold hard truth is that we are simply vessels for our DNA. The DNA's job is simple, 
keep the vessel alive and motivated for long enough for it to make copies of itself. A rationally inquiring brain would see that life does just four things. Consumption, reproduction, cannibalism, that is the killing of things of equal value, and finally addiction. Is there anything worthwhile in that? The antinatalist would say no. A rationally inquiring brain would also seek to separate real value from projected value. In the next video, I'll talk about the nature of value, the imbalance between the positives and negatives, and the absurdity of nihilism. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, when I... Uh, it wasn't until I became antinatalist that I, I realised how like brutal evolution is. Like, the reason evolution, like work like evolution is founded upon like death and suffering like it wouldn't move forward if there wasn't death and suffering because there has to be well okay no so the the, in, the inherent thing that evolution needs is um differential reproductive success but mapping that out onto okay so that doesn't inherently require suffering and death but um mapping it out onto reality in practical terms uh, it, it like differential reproductive success means differential survival and all of this sort of stuff so it basically inherently has like suffering and death built into it and i didn't think of it in that way until i mean i knew that before i was antinatalist but it didn't i didn't fully connect with the suffering and death bit and like and how like morally relevant that is um yeah which is a bit mad. In the previous videos, I sought to show that any serious person would have to accept that we live in a materialistic universe and that we got to the present day through billions of years of evolution. This being the case raises questions about value and how we distinguish between right and wrong. Without God and the moral lawgiver, is there really such a thing as right and wrong? And if there is, how do we go about recognising Okay, so um, Ilya, I think is maybe how you say your name, um, has actually put something valid in the chat. So yeah. So evolution existed without suffering until sentience came along. Okay, I say so. I do. I, I sit. Well, I was about to say I stand corrected. I sit corrected. Um, that that is true. Um, so, okay. So yeah. Okay. So with sentient beings, evolution basically inherently has um, uh, suffering and death built into it. But um, valid point, Ilya. Thanks for the correction. Um, right. Cool. Let's see what Linus is chatting. Yeah. And even if we do discover value in a materialistic universe, is it logical then to take the next step and tell others what they should or shouldn't do? The religious, as is often the case, play the God done it card. <laughs> some things are right, some things are wrong, and God decides. If God says it be bad, it be bad. God said it, I believe it, and that settles it. The difficult thing here for the religious, as is often the case, is the small issue of proving their beliefs. The contradictory moral teachings within just one holy book also belie their assertions. Those bringing arguments of pure faith to the table can get their coats at this point. Nihilists and libertarians claim that there is nothing of real value in the universe. Existence simply is, and any value placed is a human contrivance. Moral relativists, not too dissimilarly to nihilists, believe that morality is based on the consensus of a society. Society's opinions dictate what's right and wrong and that's subject to change over time as people's opinions change. One problem with this position is that it reduces Holocausts, torture and child rape to value-neutral actions that demand no regret. Such actions could, conceivably, be morally right. This may seem like an appeal to consequences fallacy. It's, um, the, the picture's gone, but that picture of the child in, in presumably their mother's arms just the fact that people can see that and think, yeah, let's bring more people into reality. Um, it's just mental. Uh, and to be fair, I mean, I used to be like that. Like, I used to see pictures like that, be aware of it, and it didn't even make me think twice about procreation. You know, it's just um, like 
the the sort of forces that evolution or the desires that evolution has built into us they're fucking strong because like <coughs> normal everyday people can see gruesome amounts of suffering even in the most wealthiest countries and and st- it's still they won't link it with procreation they it won't make them think twice they won't even blink um it's crazy like yeah those evolutionary forces are strong they've got us whipped but it's worth considering the consequences of a belief if only to motivate one to be thorough in one's research before subscribing to a belief <coughs> the position most commonly held by antinatalists is one of ethical naturalism Ethical naturalism argues that right and wrong exists objectively and is there to be recognised and not simply subjectively contrived. Things such as slavery and gratuitous torture are always wrong and would be wrong even if every person in the world believed them to be right. The distinction between ethical naturalism and moral relativism can be summed up as follows. Moral relativists claim that things are simply valued by people whereas ethical naturalists claim that things have an intrinsic value which are recognised. Yeah, I've got to say, I'm not sure where I fall on this, you know. Um, Like, so my... I'm... Well, first of all, before I say any of this, I am not, like, I've not done a degree in ethics or anything or philosophy, you know. Like, I've never formally trained in this sort of thing. So this is just stuff that I've picked up from thinking and and listening to other people and having discussions and like (coughs) it seems to me like there aren't objective moral truths like if no sentient beings existed in the world there would not still be moral there wouldn't ethics would would not be a thing there would not be these sort of um ethical truths just out there um so i i'm i'm not i can't see how they would be objective um so they must be subjective right but then that doesn't that to me that doesn't mean that oh well then anyone can just make up what they think morality is because i actually think that um like your ethics even though that they they seem to be subjective have to be based on some sort of core value and we all seem to share the same core value which is um suffering is bad basically like that seems to be even though i can't see a reason why morals would be objective they seem to be as objective as they can be whilst being subjective because every single person thinks that suffering is bad when you actually drill drill down into it now there are these people that go around doing evil shit and causing suffering to people but actually if you got them in a room pin them down and got them to lay out actually from first principles what they believe because people act incongruent with their actual ethics all the time um so just because people go around causing suffering doesn't mean that 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 is in line with their actual ethics if you drill down into it because people are inconsistent all the time i mean just have a conversation with someone about veganism you'll find out that they're inconsistent as shit um so it it like it seems to me and i could be chatting absolute bollocks maybe you will disagree with me in the chat but um it seems to me yeah they're not it doesn't seem to me that morals are objective but they do seem to it does seem to be that we all found our morals subjectively on the same axiom which is that we think suffering is bad and off of that subjective axiom you can build objective truths then um yeah i don't know um i don't know what you got i mean i know this is sort of one of the you can't really discuss discuss it in like a live chat can you it's a bit um but um yeah, I'm not sure. It's interesting. I, I I'll I'll have to have a conversation with Glenos one time about this to see um to see what he thinks of that. As a starting point to accept. So si- sorry, Sid just put in the chat. Wouldn't suffering, uh, be, wouldn't suffering is bad be an objective statement though? Um, I'm not sure. See, this is where I get this is where I get stuck. This is I I and it, like, this is like I'm saying I'm not formally trained in this, so sometimes I do trip myself up and stuff. So it seems to me that suffering is only bad because a subject 
is making that assessment and we are the subjects right um whereas if if there were no sentient beings in existence there would not be some true statement just hanging around out there that suffering is bad right like the, the like the universe from the universe's perspective it doesn't care about suffering like cuz it, it's it's just not a thing there's no, there's nothing to contain there's no container to hold the objective truths it seems to me i may be wrong may, maybe you could maybe you could say suffering is bad is objective to me it seems as objective as it can be without actually being objective be just because there's such a strong consensus around it um yeah what are other people saying are you saying what would be your response to people that say but suffering is good because it allows you to achieve great things <sighs> this is basically about instrumental suffering right um so uh do you mean this statement in general or as an argument to create someone because in general like it's not the suffering that is good. It's the thing you get from the suffering that is good. If you could get the exact same thing without going through the suffering, um, then then people would do that, right? Um, so the, the suffering is not the thing that's actually good there. So that's what I would say about that. And then w people also use that as a reason to try and justify creating people. And I don't buy that because... Um, they say, oh, well, you know, you don't want to create people because they're going to suffer, but actually suffering can be good because they can get benefits from it. Um, the response I have to that is, um, yeah, once they exist, they can get benefits from it, but the only reason they need those benefits is because they exist. And so before to create someone so that they can benefit from suffering makes no sense because they have no need for those benefits and you're imposing suffering on them for something they don't even need in the first place. So that makes no sense to me. Um, and, uh, cool. Okay, yeah, let's continue. Uh, and again, I may be wrong. Like, I'm not... This, this is not like a... Um, this sort of objective subjective thing this is not something i'm firmly ground like f you know i you know it's not like i'm saying oh i won't budge um like i could well be wrong Ding ethical naturalism one needs to accept the following a sentient creatures exist within a universe b sentient creatures have wants and needs c being deprived of wants and needs results in discomfort for sentient creatures and D, my own welfare is of the same value as other sentient creatures' welfare. Many critics of antinatalism manage to avoid the real battleground by refusing to accept these four simple claims. Some even reach unparalleled <coughs> levels of ridiculousness in claiming that their Irish heritage leads them to avoiding committing to any truths whatsoever. I shan't waste any more time on solipsistic self-molestation here, though. The argument for objective like morality is a straightforward one. Take two objects, a wall and a mouse. Take a knife and stab each object and notice how the two react. The wall will respond with indifference. The unfortunate mouse won't. With everything else being equal, stabbing walls, though strange, is morally neutral, whereas stabbing mice is morally problematic. Is this intuition? Do we simply intuitively know or believe that mice are more valuable than walls? Is it relative? Is it simply a societal consensus that has convinced us of the wrongs of randomly stabbing mice? Or do we need a god to declare, thou shalt not stab mice? Of these three arguments, the intuition argument certainly sounds more reasonable. But intuition isn't always a good indicator of truth. Only reason will lead us to the truth. The reason why mice stabbing is morally problematic is due to sentience. Sentient creatures have welfare. They have needs and have different qualitative experiential states. All else being equal, when a sentient animal is deprived of its needs, it's in a negative state. When it satisfies a need, it's positive. Walls don't have needs, cannot be deprived, and therefore can't be put in negative states of being. We know this both intuitively and rationally. This works across the board, objectively, for all sentience. Sentient life is categorically different to everything else in the universe. The needs of things which have the capacity to suffer are the only things that warrant concern. Moral relativism. Honestly, I, th I think this uh, this road to antinatalism is also road to veganism as well. 
because I don't I don't know how someone could watch this and and then not get to veganism from this as well. So nihilists are forced to believe that there is no real qualitative difference in having one's genitals gently manipulated to the point of orgasm and having one's genitals aggressively mutilated with a rusty knife. The position forces them to claim that the difference between these two states is one of perspective, of opinion. Extreme pain only seems bad. Executing millions of people based on racist beliefs and scapegoating is only considered to be bad. Some make the claim that suffering is bad, but only to those who subjectively experience it. While it's true that it's impossible to gain direct access to somebody's subjective experience, that does not stop one from making value judgments on their experiences. Looking through the lens of evolution, we can see the fact that our sentience is the same as all other sentience. What's bad for me is bad for every other sentient creature, and vice versa. Oh, Kupo's in the chat um, saying that actually watching this was what led them to veganism. Big up Kupo um, and Glynos. Um, no, that, that's that's cool. Um, like You're obviously a, the sort of person that can actually just watch something, recognize that it makes sense, and then change your behaviors accordingly, which... Most people can't do, so kudos to you. Um, yeah. It would actually be cool if, uh, like, I know some people like the, like, retro feel. And actually, I'm quite enjoying the retro feel as well of this. But um, it would be it would be good to have, like, an updated version of this where um, it was just sort of, like, higher quality, better footage, stuff like that, better audio, um, maybe when I actually have the skill to do that, I will like reach out to Glenos and um and suggest it because that would be that would be cool. Um, I just want to check how many views do all of these have. So this one has like five thousand. Um, I don't know what the I don't know what the first ones had, but I'll I'll have to check from now on. But um, yeah, this should definitely have more than five thousand views. What the fuck? The only distinction is seen through the psychology lens. My subjective psychology erroneously values my welfare more than that of others. But truth can only come through rational investigation, and not through bigoted and prejudiced psychology. Those who think that negative states are only negative to those experiencing them often bring up Hume's is-ought problem. They claim that one cannot prescribe actions based on descriptive facts. To put it simply, they say that it's illogical to say one should or shouldn't do something. This claim seemed bogus if one accepts that certain actions are good or bad. An ought can be derived from the words good and bad themselves. To be moral, one should do good things and shouldn't do bad things. But why should one be moral? Simply put, because being moral is better than being immoral. Respecting and being careful with that which is valuable is better than smashing it with a sledgehammer, regardless of anybody's opinion. It seems uncontroversial to say that if you were to see someone experiencing excruciating pain and had the power to stop the torture by simply clicking your fingers, a good or moral person would do this. Not preventing gratuitous suffering when one easily can is an immoral or bad action. It logically follows that in this situation you should, or ought to, or have a moral obligation to click your fingers, and you shouldn't sit idly by without acting. In conclusion, the issue of ethics and value is key to the antinatalist position. Antinatalists claim that it's always wrong to have children is based on the problem of suffering. If suffering didn't exist, the antinatalist would have no argument. The fact that critics of ethical naturalism only seem to show up when there's something in it for them highlights their hypocrisy and lack of integrity. I'm guessing that guy on the right is, is the guy that we were talking about earlier, but I'm guessing the guy on the left and in the middle, they're all um, like old school anti-antinatalists, I'm guessing. I, don't, I guess Amanda would know, but I don't know if anyone else would know. When you criticise acts of murder and rape, they're not heard of. But make an opinion which criticises their selfish desires to fund the mass slaughter of animals or needlessly impose life for the purposes of playing the mummy and daddy game and they come crawling out of the woodwork with their meta-ethics, semantics and word games attempting to logically prove that shit doesn't smell. <laughs> In the next video, I'll look at the main argument for antinatalism. I'll compare coming into existence with not coming into existence and show how coming into existence is always bad. 
Okay, so the next one is um, is asymmetry argument. So we're about to get our Benatar on. Um, but before we do that, let's see. Okay, so this one has seven and a half thousand views. Uh, maybe because it's like the you know the main argument, like the Ben the Benatar argument. Um, yeah, who's ready to get there? But <laughs> so um, they were apparently pyro. Hithril, Hithril Day, and um, that other guy that we were talking about before. Um, hmm. I mean, I've heard of Pyro because I think Amanda and I spoke about um, him in our discussion, but um, yeah, I didn't know the name of the other two apart from the third guy who you just you said about before. <laughs> In the previous video, I looked at ethics and concepts of right and wrong, accepting the idea that said. Oh, the man himself is in the chat. Glenos is here. Um, hey, man. Uh, I don't know how long you've been uh, watching, but um, very good series so far. Um, I got no complaints. And um, yeah, we're on. Fi so we're just over halfway. Um, but uh yeah I'll I'll message you afterwards um but um yeah thanks for putting this this together cuz it's um it's a really good series beings can be harmed and that said harm is bad we can now proceed to the meteor aspects of antinatalism one popular argument propping up antinatalism is south african philosopher david benatar's asymmetry argument in which he compares coming into existence with not coming into existence and reaches the conclusion that coming into existence is always a harm and has no benefits over not coming into existence. To avoid confusion, it's important to point out some... I actually, it was quite, um, it was quite funny. Uh, actually, well, actually, I don't know if it was funny. I don't know why I said that. Um, but um, I actually, for the first... I've, so I've explained Benatar's asymmetry to... Um, quite a lot of people before but for the first time um i mentioned before at the start that i'd recently spoken at a conference um that was the first time when i'd actually explained um kind of explained benatar's asymmetry um to a room full of people um and it was interesting uh i i, I think i did it all right because None of them seemed to. None of them put their hand up to out of confusion or anything. Um, but yeah, it's. I think. I think Benatar's asymmetry. Um, I mean, I I really like it. But in terms of explaining it, it's one of those things that can be very hard to explain to someone who hasn't spent time thinking about it before. And I actually think that the best way to to talk about it with people is to talk about how it maps onto actual cases in reality and you know Benatar does this in his book about talking about the sort of moral intuitions that are widely held by society that are very uncontroversial um, but he says are informed by this asymmetry um, and I think th like that seems to be like a good way of explaining it um, and also the the sick and healthy analogy as well i find like really useful um yeah i uh yeah i'll speak about it more at the end things right off the bat firstly there's a difference between lives worth continuing and lives worth starting benatar argues that some lives are worth continuing and some are not but argues that no lives are worth starting this is a distinction that so many people miss it's really frustrating it seems like such a simple distinction to me um, m maybe it's because I'm just so used to thinking about these things now, but it's just such a simple distinction, but it's just so easily missed by so many people. Reaching this conclusion advocates for not reproducing and does not advocate for suicide, contrary to what those opposing the philosophy like to pretend to believe. A vast majority of people feel that their lives are worth continuing. When deciding whether to have children or not, a decision that is criminally not given enough thought, the following thought process is quite common. I enjoy living and want to continue living. 
most people I know enjoy living and they want to continue living. My child will more than likely enjoy living and will want to continue living. So having a child will be good for the child because it will enjoy living. I'm actually going to be doing a video on this soon. Um, this I've had so many people say to me recently that um, you can sort of... Um, I don't know what the actual term is, but is it like retroactive consent or something or retrograde consent or something? Where it's basically like, um, oh, well, given that the vast majority of people say that they're glad to be born, that means that you can assume consent on behalf of the person and create them. Um, and there's just so many holes in that. Uh, so, I'm, yeah, hopefully I'll be doing a video soon on, on that. There are three main flaws in this argument. The first is that humans are proven to be poor in evaluating their own lives. Secondly, the people making these decisions have not yet endured their inevitable deaths, so their evaluation can't be complete. Thirdly, this is an argument about lives worth continuing and not about lives worth starting. I'll cover the first two arguments in a future video. For now, let's look at the third argument. If person X is alive and has an interest in continuing her life, then continuing her life is better than not continuing it. Most of us prefer to continue living and take measures to avoid dying. In this case, we can say that living is better than not living. However, when it comes to starting lives, we can't compare simply living and not living, but rather we have to compare coming into existence with not coming into existence. Benatar's book is, after all, titled Better Never To Have Been, and not Better To Stop Being. Benatar's asymmetry argument, in short, states that coming into existence means one will experience pleasure and suffering. The pleasure is good, while the suffering is bad. He continues, stating that the absence of suffering by not coming into existence is a positive, whereas the absence of pleasure by not coming into existence cannot be a negative, as there's no one to be deprived of said pleasure. Saying that experiencing pleasure is good while experiencing suffering is bad should be taken as a given. The controversy lies in the positives and lack of negatives of not coming into existence. How can we label the absence of suffering as good, but we can't symmetrically label the absence of pleasure as bad? And for whom is the lack of suffering bad, if there's no person to speak of? Of course, contrary to what opponents of antinatalism sometimes pretend to believe, antinatalists don't believe that there are actual beings outside of existence being benefited by not experiencing suffering. Yeah, this is um, this is what like I have this when I speak to people about consent. They say, "Oh, well, you know, it's um, there's no one who exists for their consent to be violated, so this, you know, this doesn't make sense." And they're correct, and they're not correct. I mean, they're correct that there's no one who exists for their consent to be violated. So it's not like um, there's there's someone out there unborn, you know, and they have some sort of like uh character that can be like their character of consent that can be violated but the way that i f phrase it with people is that sure th there's there's not some unborn person whose consent can be violated but the act of creating someone requires a violation of consent at the point of creating them and and then they will exist so it's creating someone requires a violation of consent it's not that th they there's someone whose violation is con uh, c consent is violated before they exist it's the actual point it's it's the act itself requires it so before you before you take it it's not you're not you know consent doesn't it's the actual act itself requires a violation of consent um and i just don't get how people don't get this it's like the people who argue about this sort of thing will also go out and buy baby clothes when they're you know when either they are or their wife is pregnant like that's <laughs> it's like clearly even though someone doesn't exist like at the moment if you do create them things can be true then like you violated their consent or they need clothes so i just don't get these people benatar argues that the absence of suffering for the person who would have been is a positive even if there's no actual person to enjoy it but the same cannot be said for the absence of pleasure the benefits of the absence of suffering can be understood from the point of view of an existing person 
person X can rightfully say that the absence of her pain, if she had never been born, would be good. However, she cannot say that the absence of her pleasures, if she had never been born, would be bad, as an absence of pleasure is only bad if there is somebody being deprived of those pleasures. If these claims are accepted, we can see that there are obvious benefits to not coming into existence over coming into existence. The asymmetry argument requires further elaboration, and some analogies may help to prove why the absence of suffering okay, is positive, the, the absence of healthy. pleasure is neither good nor bad. Mr. and Mrs. Jones are told by their doctor that they are carriers of faulty genes, and that if they were to have a child, the child would have a 95% chance of being severely disabled and living a short and painful life. If Mr. and Mrs. Jones abstain from conceiving, they will surely be labelled as responsible people. No one could rationally begrudge their decision not to conceive in the interests of the welfare of their potential child. In this case, there is value on the avoidance of suffering, even though there is no one to enjoy the absence of suffering. Mr. and Mrs. Smith are a child-free couple who don't intend to have children at all. No one could rationally accuse them of depriving their potential child of possible happiness here. Such an accusation would be absurd. The absence of pleasure is value neutral for the non-existent. Support for the asymmetry argument can also be found when considering life on other planets. If an absence of pleasure for the non-existent was really a negative, wouldn't the lack of sentient beings on the hundreds of thousands of billions of planets in our observable universe cripple us with regret? Why don't we feel sorry for the poor Martians and Venetians who don't exist? Even if potential Martians and Venetians could live lives more pleasurable than our own, it would still not be reasonable to regret their lack of existence. On the contrary, the absence of Martians and Venetians capable of living lives with greater suffering than our own can be welcomed. Having a child subjects that child to suffering and their eventual death, even though they may enjoy large parts of their lives. Not having that child cannot harm that child. Coming into existence has no benefits over not coming into existence for the individual, and therefore it's always better to abstain from procreating. The asymmetry argument is a compelling and airtight argument with no of yeah there's um I also think that the um the ace so the asymmetry um I think it shows a couple of things it shows that uh like existence existence is always a harm um there's no advantage over existing than not never existing. Um, but also a third thing it seems, um, which is that uh, like the harms that are imposed are uncompensated, which I think would be is worse than if they were compensated. Um, so like let me let me give an example. So uh, well let me use the healthy sick analogy. Um, so. Uh, just for anyone that doesn't know it, so you have two characters, right? So you've got Sick, who uh, uh, gets ill all the time, but has a capacity for quick recovery, right? So they get, they get ill, but they recover really quickly, right? And that capacity for recovering quickly is, is good for, you know, it's a benefit to Sick. Um, and then you've got Healthy. So Healthy... Um, does not have this capacity for quick recovery, right? But healthy never gets ill. And so even though healthy lacks a capacity that sick has, which is beneficial to sick, it's not disadvantageous um, to healthy because healthy had no need, has no need for this capacity. Um, and uh, yeah, so I think that that, that that is the that is the sort of analogy the story the Benatar tells to show why existing is not an advantage over never existing, but I think it also shows um, uh, um, how the harms imposed on someone in existence um, are uncompensated as well, because uh, let's say that this capacity to um, recover quickly from illness was given to sick through some sort of surgery right and so sick was made to go through this surgery and obviously there was some harm there because sick had to go through a surgery you know they had to recover afterwards this sort of thing but they were compensated with with those harms 
by the benefit of being able to recover quickly from from illness and that's a benefit to sick because sick had this existing need to recover from illness because sick gets ill and um that benefit um addresses attends to an existing need that sick has right now you go to healthy um healthy is is uh, made to go through the same surgery right so healthy has the same harms you know goes through the surgery has to recover that sort of stuff um and healthy gets the same capacity now of quick recovery from illness so healthy now also has this uh, same recovery from illness um but it's not a uh, benefit um and it doesn't compensate f- it doesn't compensate for the harm because um the supposed benefit um that healthy is receiving does not attend to an existing problem or or need or desire um uh that healthy has right so let me use a more in real life example um and not an abstract one to maybe ground it in reality so um one one good example that actually happens in reality is prostitution so um you have uh women that well a lot of women are forced into prostitution but let's say for the sake of argument these um these women uh, uh choose to go into prostitution right now if a woman chooses to go into prostitution um uh and they receive money for their uh for their like services should we put it um this is clearly a um compensatory uh the money is clearly compensatory because they can use the money to attend to certain needs and desires that they already have, right? Like food, shelter, etc. Um, but let's say you have another prostitute who also chooses to go into prostitution and instead of getting money for uh, their services, the person actually um, gets them hooked on heroin. So gets them addicted to heroin and for their services from now on doesn't give them money but gives them heroin instead now um even ignoring like the uh so this this getting hooked on heroin is is clearly not compensatory for this prostitute because um they had no need or desire for heroin um and so the uh, it's not compensatory because it doesn't attend to some sort of uh yeah need or desire that they already um have but um i'm not sure how well i explain that to be honest but um let's continue with glenis's thing to smooth over the fact that i bollocks that up is counter arguments which is perhaps the reason why pronatalists often prefer to argue over whether suffering is actually bad or not However, in issues such as child torture and child rape, the pronatalists mysteriously abandon the idea that suffering isn't bad. Despite its obvious strength, the asymmetry argument isn't the only argument for antinatalism. In the next video, I'll support the antinatalist position further by arguing that having a child is always an imposition, and that no one has the right to have children. Right, boom. So the next one is called the right to procreate. So let's see. This one. Ha- oh, this one has nine point four uh, thousand views. So getting up to ten thousand. Um, so they seem to be having more views as we go along. Um, cool. Um, yeah. Thanks, uh, Vigangelism. Uh, just saying uh, that it, it was well said, um, and I was hard on myself. Mm, I'm not sure. Um, but we'll see. Uh, okay, cool. Right. So this is the sixth uh, episode. The issue of rights and responsibilities is one that repeatedly comes up when arguing antinatalism. Some pronatalists argue that one has an obligation to have children. Others argue that there is no obligation, but that people have the right to decide to have children or not to have children, while antinatalists often argue that no one should have the right to reproduce. 
Philosophical positions which infringe on certain freedoms are often instinctively denounced as being fascist or totalitarian. How dare anyone tell me what I can and can't do with my life? Just a reminder, I am trying to keep my eye on the chat, but I think I might be missing stuff. So if anyone has any questions or comments, they definitely want to get seen. Um, there's a link in the pinned comment um, where you can send in questions and I will definitely see them here. However, procreative rights don't just affect parents, but also the people who will come into existence. Even if there's no such thing as a person who doesn't exist, it's still important to take the would-be people into consideration when considering procreative rights. If one could foresee a life of the worst horror for a would-be child, it's hardly controversial to say that preventing the conception of the child would constitute a benefit. The idea that philosophies should never infringe on one's... <laughs> Uh, who in the world thought that was a good idea? I mean, that there mu that must have been a bet. That must know. That's not. That's not a serious haircut. That's not a serious haircut. <laughs> um, I don't know uh, if uh, Ashley. If I don't know if you're watching this or if you're going to be watching this on catch up, but you better not look like that once you shave your head. Freedom and rights seems ridiculous when we consider other ethical obligations and laws that currently exist. We do not consider prohibition of murder, rape and theft to be an infringement on personal liberty. Simply put, when your actions significantly affect the welfare of others, the free country line of argument becomes redundant. If you're going to cause harm, the act needs to be justified. It's often difficult to make ethical decisions, but some cases are straightforward. Let's look at some straightforward cases. Person A prefers rock music to jazz music. Person A has the right to listen. Oh look, there's Amanda. I don't know if Amanda's still watching, but I'm I'm pretty sure that is that I'm pretty sure that's Amanda with the screwed up face on the right, isn't it? If I've gotten this wrong, I'm gonna be in deep shit. Listen to rock music. His preference does not significantly affect others. Person B enjoys rounding people up in his van and cutting their arms and legs off against their will. Person B doesn't have the right to do this. The act significantly affects the welfare of others. Person C likes whipping people, and her friend, Person C1, enjoys being whipped. C's actions may affect C1's welfare significantly, but consideration has to be given to the fact that C1 is given permission to be whipped, and as long as that permission hasn't been corrupted, C may have the right to whip C1. Person D wants to inject her child with a vaccine. The child will feel pain and struggle, but is too young and unable to give consent. The act is permissible, though, due to the presence of an ethical justification. That is, the act will prevent more serious harm. Person E really likes playing roulette, but she doesn't have any money. Her friend, E1, is asleep and has money. Despite E1 being asleep, and therefore unable to give consent, E decides to take her money anyway and go to the casino. E is known to have an optimism bias and feels sure that she will win. She's seen others lose, but is sure that this won't happen to her, and believes that her friend probably won't mind her taking the money. In this example, E is not ethically justified in taking the money. You do not have the right to arbitrarily risk someone else's welfare without the person's consent, even if consent can't be given. Even if E wins at the casino, her decision is still irresponsible and not ethically justified. You may have cottoned on to the fact that the decision to have children can be likened to person E's decision. Although in the case of procreation, the stakes are much higher, and the chances of winning are almost 0%. Even if your offspring live relatively comfortable lives, suffering and death are inevitable features of life. Bringing children into existence, especially in the developed world, also guarantees making another ethical footprint. The resources we need to live comfortably come at an ethical cost, be it energy consumption, food consumption, or the use of technological devices which are unethically produced. And what about the victims of life's horrors? What consideration should be given to them? Looking at child cancer statistics alone should raise some eyebrows about the game that people who procreate willfully play. In the UK, one in 500 children develop cancer. That equates to 1,600 children each year. What exactly can one point to that justifies this? If you were suddenly transported to a divine dimension and could buy aspects of life using child cancer as currency, would you really be willing to give 1 in 500 children cancer in exchange for X Factor, your gym membership, your positive emotions or your favourite football team winning? 
How would you explain to those 1,600 innocent children each year that they have to go through physical and psychological trauma just because people enjoy waving their Union Jacks at an unelected ruling elite? Does that really sound like a fair trade-off? Trade. Bringing children into this world guarantees harm, be it harm suffered by the individual or harm created by the individual. This being the case means that reproducing demands justification. Pronatalists are ethically obliged to justify their decisions. They must demonstrate the benefits of having children over not having children, or show how not having children is ethically problematic. In a world of disappearing... Re yeah, it, 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 is a, it, is, it does seem amazing to me that people don't get that it, it is procreators that have the burden of, of like, um, showing why their act is justified. I mean, like, if there's any act that requires moral justification... It's procreation. I mean, it's literally the most significant thing you can do to someone. I mean, it's just... Jesus. The, f the fact that people think they don't have to come up with a justification. ...sources, overpopulation, and more than 150 million children who could be adopted. A rational defence of procreation is all but impossible. In conclusion, it's my contention that people don't even consider these ethical questions before reproducing. In large, this is because of an erroneous view that life is generally a good thing for the majority of people. In the next video, I'll look at the quality of lives, why personal assessments of happiness and satisfaction are unreliable, and why our lives really are a lot worse than we think they are. This, this next video will be interesting because, um, like... I see, and I think this this actually came up in. Uh, I'm not sure how many of you have seen Amanda's recent uh, conversation slash shouting match um, with Corey Anton. Um, and but basically, um, you should go watch it, and I, I'll link it in the description after this uh, when when the stream is finished. But. Um, he says a few times throughout their discussion that uh, antinatalists need to prove that life contains more suffering than it does, like l like more bad things than it does good things. Um, and this is kind of what Glenos is is saying here is that um, you know we need to dismantle people's sort of optimism bias with regards to judging their own life. Now, I do agree, practically speaking, that would be beneficial to antinatalism, but I, I don't think it is something that is necessarily true about antinatalism. Like, I think your, your life could have way more good than it does bad, but still be not worth starting. Um, I, just, I just think this is a, a red herring that, that natalists bring up. Like when, when Corey said, "Oh well, the antinatalist has to show that there's more harm than than ben like than good stuff in antinatalism," and it's like, no, like why do you think we need to show that? Like, what, wh like that may be true, and for a lot of people's lives, it will be true um, that there's more like bad than good, but even if you accept just for the sake of the argument that every person who exists currently has more good than bad it's irrelevant it's just it's not a relevant factor um because of benatar's asymmetry like there was no one to ever want the good in the first place so no matter how good much good there is it doesn't really matter um because it comes at the cost of bad and the good was never wanted common responses to the anti John just put in the chat that I lost him with the prostitution story. See, I told you I didn't explain it well. Antinatalist argument is to claim that antinatalists suffer from mental or physical illnesses which cloud their judgment and lead them erroneously to believe that I think the volume is really low for this one, so just a heads up for people. Um I I've got it on full everywhere, so I can't do anything. Um you you'll just have to put your volumes up and I will just try and speak quite quietly so that um I don't overpower you. No lives are worth starting. The antinatalist is suffering from a pessimism bias, and if they viewed the world from a realistic point of view, as most people do, they would no longer support the antinatalist view. 
is a temptation amongst many to believe that most people are realists. Most people evaluate, predict and deduce things more or less accurately, whilst a small percentage of people are pessimists who hate the world, and a small percentage of people are optimistic dreamers with their head in the clouds. This seems to be a combination of two logical fallacies. Firstly, argumentum ad populum. If most people believe that life is generally a good thing, then it probably is. Secondly, it's an argumentum ad temperentium, or a golden mean fallacy. Some people think that life is terrible, others think that life is wonderful. Therefore, life is probably somewhere in the middle, with both good and bad aspects. Given that these are logical fallacies, we would need another way of measuring how good our lives are. This seems like a fairly straightforward task. Create a survey with the question, how good is your life, out of ten. If the majority of people answer six or above, then statistically life is generally a good thing, and the antinatalists have no case. Not only does this point of view fail to address the asymmetry <laughs> argument and the no right to impose risk argument, asking people how they feel about their lives is not a reliable measurement of finding out how good people's lives are. The first reason is that the assessment is incomplete. Asking a person whether their decision to get intoxicated on alcohol was a good one or not will result in a vastly different answer depending on when the question is asked. Ask this person at the height of their intoxication and you'll receive a positive answer. Ask them during their debilitating hangover and you'll get a decidedly negative one. When asking people to assess whether their lives are worth living, we get only assessments of the living, never the assessments of the dead. Assessments of the dying may yield positive answers, but the assessments of the dying are still saturated with all kinds of corrupting psychological mush. This leads me to the second point. Our psychology makes us extremely bad at evaluating well-being and happiness objectively. In her book The Optimism Bias, award-winning cognitive neuroscientist Tali Charot shows that approximately 80% of us suffer from an optimism bias. People with this bias are known to have unreliable memories, exaggerating positive... I've never heard of that book, The Optimism Bias. Have, have any of you read it? I'm just going to note it down. Um, Tally Chereau, I've never, I've never heard of it. Um, yeah, if any of you have read it, let me know what you think in the uh, chat. So that'll be interesting to read. I'll have to add it to my ever-growing list that's never going to shrink, because I do not read that much anymore, but I need to get back on it. ...aspects while conveniently downplaying or outright forgetting negative aspects, and have their predictions about the future distorted by hopes and wishful thinking, rather than relying on statistics or reason. People with an optimism bias consider themselves to be more interesting, <laughs> more attractive, to have a better mm -hmm. sense of humour and to be better drivers than the average person. It's simply a statistical impossibility for most people to be better than the average person. Interestingly, Chereau found that people who suffer from mild depression see the world realistically and not with a pessimism bias, contrary to what the appeal to the golden mean argument suggests. Whether having an optimism bias is actually destructive or not is a separate question. I will concede that there are some good aspects of being optimistic. Less anxiety in some cases of self-fulfilling prophecies can yield positive results. However, the negative aspects can be extremely destructive. Stockholm Syndrome and the belief of one's resilience against becoming addicted to destructive narcotics being just two. Uh, Cooper's um, apparently read that book and or half of it and says it's very interesting. Yeah, I'll have to um, I'll have to read it. It's interesting. Um, I've I've heard this is one thing which I'm not sure that I agree with Benatar on uh, when he talks about optimism bias. Um, I don't. I don't necessarily disagree. I'm just not sure what I think yet, um, because I've heard good arguments for at, for humans having an optimism bias and for them having having a negativity bias, and how both would make sense evolutionarily as well. So I really don't know what to think, to be honest, at the moment. So I need to read more around it. The question tackled in this video, though, is about how good our lives are. And there's enough evidence in psychology to suggest that personal assessments of well-being just won't do the trick. Traditionally, there are three ways of measuring how good lives are. Hedonism theory, desire theory, and objective list theory. Hedonism deals with raw emotional states. While some factors such as timing and distribution need to be considered, it can be summarised as a battle between positive, negative, and neutral states. 
if we laugh more than we cry, that's a positive. If we cry more than we laugh, that's a negative. There are also comparative positives, the reduction of negative states. For this video, I won't take these into consideration, as even the most insane natalist couldn't possibly argue that having a child and intentionally making it suffer just so that it can recover would constitute a positive. If you subscribe to the hedonism theory of happiness, then most people's lives go in the category of bad. Even healthy lives consist of hunger, thirst, being too hot or too cold, stress and tiredness on a daily basis. In addition to these, we have the occasional bouts of illness, headaches, nausea, sadness, guilt, loneliness, and many of us will eventually face the torture of cancer, bereavement and depression. Most people indeed write off the daily inconveniences as being irrelevant, particularly those suffering from an optimism bias. But if we are to evaluate lives using hedonism, we are to take into consideration all positive and negative aspects, whether we deem them relevant or not. In his book, Better Never To Have Been, David Benatar argues that positive states do exist. What is, uh, why is that cover changed? That's so weird. But against a backdrop of suffering and not against a backdrop of neutrality, as an optimist might believe. The second theory regarding happiness is desire theory. Desire theory states that a life goes well for a person when what they want to be the case is the case, and life goes badly when what they want to be the case is not the case. If I want to have friends and I have friends, that constitutes a good. If I want to have friends and I don't have friends, that constitutes a bad. There are three reasons why desire theory shows our lives to be bad overall. Firstly, many desires go unfulfilled. 80% of people wish they looked better, more than 50% of people it's um it's it's funny uh so um benatar talks about this in uh i or i think he also talks about it in um in his book the human predicament i might be wrong though but um at least in the human predicament he does at least talk about how our lives are about the meaning in life and how um on a cosmic level they are meaningless and I lent my copy of the Human Predicament to my friend who he's hiking up to Everest Base Camp at the moment. Um, and so I sent him like a message when I sent him the book and I said, um, enjoy like walking up a mountain at like minus 20 degrees, reading about how your life <laughs> life is meaningless, uh, <laughs> which is just quite it's quite a funny, um, quite a funny thought him up there in like horrible conditions reading about how how his life is shit dissatisfied in their jobs and almost all people would like not to worry about their finances secondly when desires are fulfilled it's often temporary marriage ending in divorce successful business ventures ending in bankruptcy and sporting achievement eventually leading to failure thirdly and most importantly is the notion of the treadmill of desires the satisfaction of fulfilling a desire is often short-lived and quickly replaced by another desire. Satisfying hunger and thirst is always temporary. The rich want to become richer. Just a quick one for the chat. Um, who, uh, um, anyone in the chat or anyone watching the stream at the moment, um, wh whereabouts in the world are you? Can you put, um, put what country you're in? I just want to see sort of like whereabouts people are. It'd be interesting to see and being entertained is eventually replaced by being bored again. This problem was addressed by both Schopenhauer and the Buddha. Schopenhauer claimed that happiness did not exist independently and was merely the temporary reduction of suffering. While the I, I need to read some um, Schopenhauer. I've, uh, I've got on my reading list his um, The World is, what is it, Wills is, The World is Will and Representation or something like that. Um, so we've got um, Ukraine, uh, BC, Canada, United States, Israel, the Caribbean, um, US, US, America, US, um, California, US, Sweden. Um, I, not, I may have said this before, to be honest, Cooper, I can't remember, but um, hey, Elden, Indonesia, Poland, uh, Siesto. I don't know how, if I pronounced that right. Um, but yeah, Cooper, I may have said this before, but I, I lived in Uppsala for a year. Um, I don't know whereabouts in Sweden you are, but... Um, yeah, and um, I saw... Uh, yeah, Skypug is in Ukraine. I hope you're doing well. I know the situation over there is, is rough, of, to put it lightly. 
Um, but yeah, I hope you're doing well. Buddha suggested that desire was the principal cause of suffering. Again, our inherent optimism may dismiss the importance of not satisfying. Actually, mentioning um, Ukraine, there was a story in the news here, and uh, over in uh, Australia, um, there was a story in the news uh, in in the UK, uh, in the UK news about Ukraine, which was it just blew my mind. Um, so it was around about when um, the invasion of Ukraine had just started, and uh, it was maybe like a few. Uh, I can't remember how long in it was, but it, it was near the beginning. And um, there was some place underground where people were sheltering. And it had been turned into a makeshift maternity ward. And there were um, people, there were like women giving birth there. And there was some video footage of it and stuff. And it was being circulated around, um, you know, and being shown by news outlets. And they were saying, you know, are oh, the miracle of life even in the darkest times? This gives us hope for the future. And I just watched this and I just thought the levels of depravity that the like humans go to. I mean, even in that situation, we we frame it in a positive way. I just think there's just like what if there's if nothing is going to wake you up, then like. <laughs> If if a country being invaded and and a, and a and a vulnerable child being brought into that is not going to wake you up to antinatalism, it's just fuck me. I mean, Jesus Christ, it's just crazy the level of delusion people have. Desires, but according to the desire theory, it's difficult to see how most people's lives are operating at a net benefit. The third and final theory of happiness is the objective list theory. This theory states that there's a list of things which objectively make lives good or bad, whether we desire them or not. Included in the list are education, freedom from disease and suffering, social relationships and material comforts. This theory has benefits in understanding how good a life is in comparison with other people's lives, but it fails at answering objectively how good our lives are. When we think of the Middle Ages, the barbarism, disease, suffering and lack of sanitation, we consider those lives to be bad. What's to stop us then from comparing our current situation to a more ideal one and concluding that our lives are bad, given that we don't have immediate satisfaction of hunger and thirst, we face torturous disease and we age, losing our beauty, clarity of thought and nobility. A truly independent and objective measure of a life worth living would have to transgress our current situation. Under this theory, it's difficult to argue that our lives are independently good. In conclusion, I accept that many will write this point of view off as being overly pessimistic or negative, without enough focus on the positive aspects of lives. I put that down to an optimism bias where you may not. What's evident, though, is that human history has been laden with suffering, and aside from wishful thinking and hope, there isn't much evidence to suggest that things are going to get better in the future. Despite our intuitive feeling that our lives are alright, and our wishful thinking that things will get better, a rational assessment of our situation shows the opposite to be true. Is there a need to bring more children into the world that extends beyond one's desire to have children? What good are we achieving by having more children? Do we not have an ethical obligation to delve deeper than our own ego gratification and psychologically corrupted optimistic view of what it means to be alive? In the next video, I'll talk about the step to ethelism and how the problem of suffering extends beyond human life to all sentient life. Cool, so we're on the second to last video. Um, if you haven't clicked the like button already, um, smash it up. Um, and let's get the last, uh, sorry, second to last. Um, let's see how many, okay, so this one's got 14,000. Yes, they seem to be going up. Um, Okay, cool. So, this one is, what was this one called? This one's called Ethelism. Um, so, let's see. Cool. Let's go. Throughout this series, the focus has been on antinatalism, the idea that it's unethical for humans to reproduce, that humans get a rough deal and are better off not being brought into existence. 
There are different ways of approaching antinatalism. Some antinatalists believe that overpopulation is a problem, and we should therefore try to limit the amount we reproduce in order to reduce the population. The Chinese one-child policy is an example of this kind of antinatalism. This type of antinatalism is sometimes referred to as Malthusian antinatalism, named after the English scholar Thomas Malthus. Malthusian antinatalists argue that it's unethical to have children under certain conditions, but that there are possible conditions under which it may be ethical to have children. Another popular antinatalist group is the voluntary human extinction movement. Vemt believes that humans are responsible for environmental degradation. Vemt. <laughs> I guess this was before vehement was uh, was coined. Degradation and that the eradication of man-made suffering would solve the problem of resource. So this, if any, for anyone that doesn't know, vehement is uh, the the movement that last night. Um, he says found rather than founded, or f he says he's a finder rather than a founder. I can't remember exactly how he says it, but um, yeah, if anyone hasn't seen that yet, you go a few videos back. I did a, I interviewed him. Just depletion and allow the animals to thrive. The final antinatalist idea is ethalism. It's life spelt backwards. Whilst many ethalists agree that population control and human extinction have merit, it only deals with part of the problem. The tenets of ethelism are that life itself is a backward and broken system, that is sentient life. While humans are responsible for their fair share of suffering, it's merely a drop in the ocean of suffering that occurs on this planet. While nature documentaries and popular science paint a picture of food chains, niches and a controlled ecosystem, supervised by Mother Nature, the reality is that sentient organisms are involved in a chaotic and brutal battle of survival. And this is not a problem that goes away simply by ignoring it, by going vegan, or even by bringing about the extinction of humans. Ethelism states that a universe without sentient life is preferable to a universe with sentient life. If there were a red button that one could press to end all life instantly, Ethelism argues that one would be ethically obliged to press it. Another thought experiment has been proposed as a way of softening the inevitable outrageous reaction, a red button that would sterilise all living organisms on the planet. While this also carries with it its own fair share of problems, for many, it's a much more psychologically comforting thought experiment. Naturally, the reception to ethelism is often one of fear, horror, and even anger. Many mistakenly believe that ethelists advocate for going around killing people and animals left, right, and centre. Its detractors often claim that it's a death cult followed by radical extremists. Comparisons to Nazis or ISIS are never far away. The truth is that ethelists are people concerned with the problem of evil and suffering in the world. They're often vegans and people with lifestyles that aim to minimise their ethical footprint. They recognise the reality of our situation, that sentient life is caught up in a biological game that it cannot win. Animals are vessels for their DNA. The goal is to survive long enough to reproduce, no matter the cost, no matter the pain, no matter the suffering. The prize? creating more players to play the game before dying, almost always painfully, pushing a heavy rock up a hill for the sole purpose of passing the same burden on to another before meeting a grisly death. The DNA molecule ensures that its vessels stay motivated through several psychological programs, so that we can write poems and aphorisms rejoicing in our rock-pushing burden, shame those who see the activity as ridiculous, and even to invent a magic endgame where one is finally free of their rock-pushing duties and lives in paradise for eternity. A love of nature and life can be explained psychologically, but can never be defended rationally. Some statistics may help to paint a more accurate picture of the reality we live in. Humans are responsible for some 50 to 100 million animals being in research laboratories, and about 24 billion animals in livestock, not including fish. The suffering these animals endure is well known, and Vemt claims that human extinction would solve these problems. However, what about animals in the wild? The number of animals in the wild is so numerous that to calculate it would be almost impossible. One estimation by mathematician and computer scientist Brian Thomas... Oh, I'm glad Brian got a mention in this. Um, yeah, Brian's an interesting guy. Um, he's written a lot online. Um, and I have read nowhere near as much as I should have of his um, of his writing. But he, he seems to be a very um, interesting guy. 
Um, he'd be an interesting guy to talk to, but apparently he's quite hard to get hold of. Dick estimates the number to be 20 quintillion or 20 billion billion individual animals. To put that into perspective, that's three times the approximate number of grains of sand on the whole Earth. This includes some 70 billion wild mammals living emotionally rich lives as sensitive to cold, hunger and pain as ourselves. <laughs> Jay, you saying Brian looks like he'd be a brother of mine. It's just because he's white, he's a man and he has a buzz cut. <laughs> Many people claim it's cruel to keep animals in zoos and circuses, citing their mistreatment and suffering, but then ignore the suffering that occurs in the wild. Suffering is suffering, whether it's man-made or not. An elephant being whipped by... Um, Billy's just asked if I believe... Oh no, Lauren Lawrence Ashton. Is there someone in the chat called Lawrence Ashton? Or are you, are you, have you spelt my name wrong? Um, but if you're asking me, um, uh, yeah, um, I recognize that evolution has been happening and continues to happen. A human doesn't dislike the activity more than being eaten alive by a crocodile on the basis that it's unnatural. The value is in the suffering, and our concern should be with the suffering too, regardless of whether it's part of nature or not. Ethicists believe that all suffering is valuable and we should seek resolutions to this problem. The fact that many can rid themselves of the idiocy of religion only to replace it with another idiotic notion that nature knows best is testament to the resilience of our programming. Our disposition for blind spotting inconvenient and painful truths is a fascinating sign that we carry with us nuanced and somewhat sophisticated psychological software, but it's a tragic failure of our capacity to do philosophy well. What kind of mental gymnastics would it take to be confronted with the indisputable fact that unimaginable numbers of feeling organisms are brutally tortured and destroyed in the most horrific manner one can imagine, and then to respond with, that's nature though, or even worse, to conclude that this suffering is meaningless as it's a them and not a me, despite the biological evidence showing their suffering to be indistinguishable from our own in any meaningful sense. In the time it takes you to watch this video, thousands upon thousands of living, breathing, sensitive organisms are eaten alive, bleeding, panicking, whimpering, terrified, writhing in excruciating pain. Others are dying slowly of thirst, hunger and cold, and are being eaten alive slowly from the inside by savage parasites. The pleasures that organisms feel are, at best, mild compensation for the brutal pain and suffering they will endure, and not a justification for the game they're involved in. Can it really be rationally defended that this is a fair trade-off? If we are to take the problem of suffering seriously, can it rationally be argued that on the balance of things, sentient lives being brought into existence are profiting? Pressing the red button may run contrary to our programming and cultural cultivation, but can it really be unethical? Our time in existence is limited. The day will come when sentient life ceases to exist, leaving no trace that we were ever here. We cannot save ourselves from death, but we can choose how much pain and anguish we will allow to continue. Pressing the red button immediately brings to an end the unfathomable torture that's occurring this very second, and saves an even more unfathomable amount of potential future torture. The alleged downside is that future generations will not come to be. But for whom is this a problem? Humans are fucking scumbags. I just... I I just don't get it. The amount of pain people inflict on innocent beings, it's just... Non-existent beings cannot be deprived of anything, but they can be spared the potential suffering that their coming into existence guarantees. For the moment, the red button is only an exercise in the hypothetical world. In the next video, I'll look at various ways in which the end game can be. Okay, so we're on the last video. Uh, okay, so this one's only eight and a half thousand, so this has gone down. Um, all right, let's have a let's have a look at this last one before we get on to the last one. Um, just remember, link in the pinned. Um, pinned uh, chat at the top um, if you want to send through a question that will definitely get answered.
One of the most difficult things for many to accept in the Ephelist philosophy is that its proponents are in favour of bringing about the end of all life. The immediate reaction is to equate ending life with something ethically abhorrent, some kind of uber-genocide or cultish mass murder. Unfortunately, the distinction between killing off life, that is, cutting lives short, and facilitating the dying out of life, that is, not creating new lives, is hardly ever understood. Too often, no matter what arguments are put forward, the response is simply, if your goal is to end life, then your plan is an evil one. The other thing which is ignored, however, is that all life will come to an end eventually. Like it or not, your subjective experience will end upon your death. Our species will, as a fact, go instinct and all life will inevitably come to an end. Um, so Billy's just asked in the chat, um, some antinatalists believe we were created by evil. What are your thoughts? Um, I'm not sure what you mean by that, to be honest. Um, do they mean like we were created by an evil process and they characterize procreation as evil? Or it is in there some sort of otherworldly entity that we're labeling as evil that is that is doing all of this? I'm not sure what you mean. So what are the ethical concerns of extinction? There are three main concerns. Firstly, that it's bad to cut lives short by killing. Secondly, whether extinction is brought about naturally or otherwise, it may be bad for those who directly precede the extinction. And thirdly, some argue that the state of extinction is a negative one in its own right, due to the lack of conscious beings capable of positive feelings. The third point seems to be the most widespread belief, although it's also the dumbest. As mentioned in a previous video, the point of ephelism is to understand the situation or game that we're in. Understanding that there's nothing to be won. Life, at least for humans, is a combination of psychological mechanisms, keeping us motivated enough to believe that we're achieving something important on the one hand, and very real suffering on the other hand. Whilst it may feel good to chase carrots, aggrandise our purpose in life, or cheer on our favourite sports teams, it's simply a fool's errand to show that this is something that actually has positive value. That is to say, if you hadn't been brought into existence, the world would be a worse place for your not being able to watch Breaking Bad. On the other hand, the pain and suffering that you'll not only endure, but more importantly, unavoidably impose on the world is of real value. The sickness, heartbreak, grief and death you will endure, as well as the adverse effects of the biosphere you eat, means that your existence will leave behind a foul stench. Simply put, nothing bad happens by not coming into existence, yet the bad is guaranteed by your coming into existence. Ergo, it's better not to come into existence. This applies not only to an individual, but also to a species, and to all life in general. If we understand and accept that we're in a no-win game, we can then look at ways of stopping the game. This does not entail going around ending lives randomly in a fit of madness. We can ask the questions about ethical and rational ways of bringing about a clean and graceful exit. Not only can we do this, but there's also an ethical duty to do this. As humans, we are the only species able to bring about the extinction of life in a clean way. If humans were to die out, we would be left with the prospect of gladiator war among the animals until they are killed off naturally. A prospect worthy of huge concern and one which we have an ethical duty to avoid. But two things are clear. Firstly, all life is going to die out eventually. Secondly, the longer the game continues, the more harm there will be. So what would an ethical extinction plan look like? Regardless of how this is done, there will be some mess. The goal is to minimise the mess as much as possible. The first thing would be to reduce the population of sentient beings. As unlikely as it is, if ethelism ever became widely accepted by humans, it wouldn't take long to reduce the human population. The ethical issues here would be that there would still be a need to create new humans for a few more generations to execute the extinction plan, and that these humans would be born and raised to fulfil a specific purpose. We would also need to reduce the animal population, we can drastically reduce the number of livestock animals simply by not eating them. Mm. If there's no demand to consume animals, then they will simply not be bred. If we were to stop animal farming completely, there would be an issue of what to do with 60 billion animals. Some might argue in favour of phasing out animal slaughter, and instead of stopping animal slaughter, we could simply stop animal breeding. Others who think it's too inhumane to slaughter animals may be in favour of developing and using widespread contraception, possibly introducing it into the water supply of animals. 
The contraception in the water method is another possibility for reducing the populations of wild animals, but it's undoubtedly a mammoth task in terms of practicality to attempt to reduce the number of animals in the wild, even if we do have some methods of ethical anti-reproduction. It may be a case where we have to accept that these animals will not be allowed to die out and will have to be killed off. This is an ethical concern, something of a mess, but it should be remembered that extinction is inevitable, whether it's controlled and deliberate. It's interesting. Um, the use of contraception um, in wild animal populations um, is something that's gaining more uh, traction and has more research being done on it. Uh, the Wild Animal Initiative, uh, they have been doing research on this, um, which is it's interesting. Um, there are two uh, there are two examples where on a mass scale if it isn't being done already it may begin i think it's going to soon start being rolled out um and that is with pigeon and rat populations in cities across the world um now whether you would call these wild animals or not is is another question they're sort of like quasi wild right like they're very used to being around humans they've built their lives around um human civilization um or at least we've forced them to anyway. But that's that's the lay of the land at the moment. And at the moment, the protocol is that every h however long, humans just mass kill, um, usually by poisoning, apparently, um, rats and pigeons in cities. So there's just like a culling. Um, but it's being suggested now that actually instead of culling, we can just... Uh, uh, put contraception into what in what they eat or their water supplies where they get their drink uh, their water from um, and this will mean that rather than loads of them just breeding each other into existence and then getting killed and also just suffering from being in existence generally um, it'll mean that they just simply won't be brought into existence which seems like a way better um, way to address that problem than letting them breed and killing them um, so, yeah, this is not just what Glynos is talking about now. I mean, extinction, obviously, is still this hypothetical thing. But um, the use of contraception in wild animals is not a hypothetical anymore. It is something that is has actually happened in small cases and could actually start to happen on a much bigger scale soon as well. It's all brought about naturally. If the tenets of ethelism are true, it's better that extinction take place sooner rather than later, and the ethical cost of killing off a species may be worth it if the result is that no new lives are brought into existence. To summarise, where possible, extinction should be brought about by dying out, but where dying out is not possible, species will have to be killed off. What would this killing off look like? For obvious reasons, the world would have to be left totally uninhabitable, the risk of allowing sentient beings to roam the earth, killing each other without anyone to press the off button is one that can't be ignored. With current technology, we're nowhere near having the capability to blow up the earth. Some revolutionary discoveries, it seems, would need to be made before that becomes a viable option. Another possibility suggested has been to slow down the earth's rotation so that it plummets into the sun. This also seems like an idea in the realms of fantasy as we appear to have nowhere near the technology capable of achieving such a feat. Whilst blowing up the Earth may be an impossible feat, making it uninhabitable to 99% of life forms is within our capabilities. If all our current nuclear weapons were detonated, it would put the Earth into a nuclear winter lasting some 2,000 years. This would kill off all life with the exception of microbial life and possibly some deep sea fish. For many, even considering ways to end all life is unethical. Ironically, our current life affirming civilization is flirting dangerously close to human extinction. Several factors, including the loss of global dimming, the firing of the cathrate gun, and the moistening of the upper troposphere could bring about abrupt climate change. The possibility of nuclear war or the meltdown of nuclear power facilities also looms over us as a potential cause for extinction. The effects of climate change are alarmingly ignored, overlooked or downplayed, and the all-too-common human life script of it'll never happen to us may just be our undoing. Although there'll be nobody to write the history books, humans will go down in history as the biggest waste, capable of reason, compassion and understanding, but too owned by psychological addictions and selfishness. The so, um, I'm not sure if it's best to bring this up, but I think it's worth 
stating without judgment um just so people are aware so um uh je's just asked me a question uh do we think do i think we're going to go extinct in this century no um but anyway so i i shared this uh this live stream uh when i was advertising it in um the main um antinatalist uh facebook group and the english one with um i think it's around 10,000 people in it and um sorry my mind was just scattered then um yeah so i uh i shared it in a bunch of groups for people so that they could see that this was upcoming and i shared it in the uh the antinatalism facebook group the 10,000 english speaking one and the post got uh denied um and one of the admins i think i know which one but i won't say by name um just because i don't want to start dramas i just want to make like people aware that this is sort of happening this sort of like um gatekeeping is happening um uh the it got denied because um the admin had seen this series and said that at the end there when glinos talks about um extinction and killing certain animals um which you you know everyone will have their own opinion on um he says that 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 is not an acceptable thing to be uh sharing in uh publicly so he denied the the post um my view on that is uh so my view on this topic generally is uh it's it doesn't seem like it should be the primary concern at the moment um like what are we going to do when we get to this when we like what are going to be the final stages that we do when we're clean like cleaning up basically um like i'm not even convinced we're ever even going to get to that stage so there's not really doesn't seem like it's that pressing a thing to talk about at the moment like now we should be talking about actually what can we practically do now um and where should we generally be moving towards in in the future um but the fact that this admin thought that it wasn't that they they thought that they were able to um not even allow this discussion in uh the biggest english speaking facebook group on this topic is um to me it seems uh, quite gatekeepy and um i think these things should be open for debate i think if uh if they disagree with it they should engage in discussion on it and um and show people like look this is something that certain uh people believe i disagree with it and this is why um not just to not allow it to be surfaced um because even if you um try to not allow it to be surfaced if someone is interested in this topic they will find out about these views um and so that that they that like they'll find out about it um and if you uh if you have the arguments as you think to counteract them then you should be making your arguments known so that when people do eventually find out about these topics and these questions your opinion is front and center um but yeah, I just I thought I should make that known. Um, cool. Okay. We hope maybe that human recklessness does enough damage that it may wipe out the other sentient beings along with themselves. Well, boom! That was it. Um, cool. So, um, I d I don't think Linus is in the chat anymore, but um. Yeah, so that was uh, 
that was the Road to Antinatalism series. Um, I thought that was decent. I mean, that so that was the first time I'd ever seen it. I thought it was like well put together, well structured. Um, I think. I mean, sure, visually it would it could benefit from some updating, but um, I thought all in all it was like very decent, very comprehensive. Um, actually, I don't know. Actually, if I'm going to be really honest, I don't know if it was as comprehensive as it could have been. I think it left out some. Um, well, it maybe didn't fully leave out certain arguments, but um, it didn't formally present them and say, look, this is an actual coherent argument that you should be aware of. Um, so, yeah, but it, it was interesting. Um, I in I enjoyed it. What, I what did everyone else um, think of it? Put in the chat what you thought. Um, let me know what you thought of that, if you've seen it before or you haven't seen it before. Um, but, uh, yeah, I thought... Um, I thought it was good work, especially for... Ah, I've closed it now, so I can't see when um, when it's uh, when it was made. But I think it was a while ago that it was um, that it was made. Maybe someone in the chat will know. Um, but yeah, uh, what's people saying? So, um, great job, Glynos. Um, decent series, but yes, could have had a bit more comprehensive. Um, yeah, but also, I mean, like, what do you get, like, I don't think one series is going to be able to capture everything. I mean, maybe it could, but that would be like an undertaking to have everything and the, um, you know, the sort of the, the resources and the time to do that. Um, and I think, as far as I'm aware, Glynos just did that all on his own. He wasn't paid for it or anything. So, um, yeah. But, um, yeah, I thought it was really good. Um, and... Yeah, I he's done another series um, called Adventures of an Antinatalist, which I will uh, probably do another live um, uh, watching that as well. But I don't think that'll be soon. That'll be at some point in the future. Um, and hopefully at some point I'll be able to get Glynos on. Um, but at the moment he's not in, in a situation where he really would want to do that, um, which is very fair enough. Um so yeah i will but i will have to get him on at some point but anyway so um yeah uh i have a couple things i wanted to um go over uh before finishing um and kupo saying that the adventures of an antinatalist is a hilarious series um so looking forward to that one yeah, I mean, to be fair to Glynos, he put in some humor here, like he memed the shit out of that series. Um, so, yeah, that was good. I appreciated the memes. Um, so, yeah, a couple things before we finish. Uh, I think there was a third thing, but I've forgotten what it was. But I've got notes to talk about, too. So, first thing is, um, okay, I remember the third thing. Okay, let's go third thing first. So the first w uh, thing is um, we are getting close to 1,000 subscribers. So um, I'm not sure when it will happen. Uh, it will probably happen. So we're on 967 at the moment. So we'll probably hit 1,000 some point this week. And... I will then be posting my Ask Me Anything. So that's already filmed. I will just post it whenever we hit 1,000. Um, so that'll be sometime this week. Um, and that is I, uh, quite a few people who are in the chat now sent in questions. So they've, they've all been answered. Um, and maybe some, of some more people in the chat did them under false names. So I'm, I'm not sure. Um, but yeah, so that'll be some point this week. Uh, so that, that and we cover like I, the questions cover a whole range of topics. Um, so it was quite interesting to talk about all of them. I do have to say though, some of the questions. So I answered all the questions that came through. I didn't leave any out. Um, some of the questions I didn't have amazing answers to, just because I did it like on the spot. I didn't prepare anything. I just like went through the questions. Like bam, bam, bam. Um, 
and just did it on the spot so some like in some of the questions i didn't have anything come to mind properly in the moment but i said what i could um but um yeah uh and so th th so that's this week that, that will it hopefully will be some point this week um the second thing is today uh earlier today i recorded the next installment of uh antinatalism around the world um so that video will be coming out soon uh i've nearly finished editing it um and that will be actually um before i say what it'll be which country um put in the chat which country you want to see um a a video for an antinatalism around the world which country do you want to see um them done for um and maybe try and guess which one the next one is for. And while you're putting that in the chat, I'll do the third thing. So the third thing is this conference. So I, there was a, a conference in Amsterdam recently. It was the world's first misanthropy conference. And I spoke there with a friend who is also a vegan antinatalist. I won't say her name just in case she doesn't want um, other people to know. But... Um, yeah, I spoke at that conference with her um, about the interconnectedness of veganism, antinatalism and misanthropy. And it was a really interesting conference overall. It was really interesting to speak there and to get questions from people. Um, it was in front of mostly academics, uh, which was interesting. Uh, there was maybe about 40 people there in total over it was a three-day conference i was only there for two days um but it was yeah it was very interesting and um yeah i i don't think i am saying this from ego i think this is true um after all of the presentations there were questions and it seemed like our presentation uh, we were put in the category of antinatalist and there were three different presentations on the topic and um i think antinatalism was the t was the was the panel was the topic that had the most engagement i think that was the one that people had the most questions about were the most enthusiastic so that was really good to see um but yeah so i will be doing a video soon go uh, talking about that conference and giving the presentation to you guys with um uh my friend who i did the did the presentation with um so that's that's coming up as well uh ian james kid wasn't there but we did we did uh he we used him in our research cool so um final thing is to go back to what country the next um antinatalism around the world installment is for and i think only one person put a country in the chat which was Masilia, who put japan and you're spot on Masilia. it is it is for japan so the next country is going to be um is going to be japan oh, okay no wait amanda also put uh, one in iceland it's not from iceland but iceland would be an interesting one yep so the next installment will be coming from japan and it's actually the first one that i'm doing with two people oh did je say um japan as well i must have missed that um but um yeah this is the first one where i'm talking to two people um so i'm talking to uh two japanese um uh well, I was going to say two Japanese antinatalists. Actually, one of them is antinatalist. The other one is just very interested in antinatalism. But I'm not sure if she actually would call herself an antinatalist at the moment. But um, I was speaking to Miyu and Kurono, which was really interesting. Um, so look forward to that one. Um, but I think that's everything. So I hope, like, thank you so much for joining the stream. I hope you've enjoyed it and enjoyed watching Glynos's excellent work. Um like stay tuned for my video about the conference the antinatalism in japan and my 1000 subscriber ask me anything um remember to um i will there's a link to uh, my twitter in the in the description so definitely check out that um you'll have um 
there'll be date like I post daily on the, in there. And I think that's it. Um, thanks everyone for coming along. I'm just gonna name a few people I can see in the chat. Je, um, Natural is dead. Over, Kasan, um, Amanda, obviously, Masilia, Ro, Sid, um, Kupo and loads of other people who I can't see in the chat at the moment. But um, thanks so much again, and I will see you all in the next one.